Um, and our, the next session is Sonic Ecologies and Technology. And technology is a subject that's been, you know, touched on in a few of the presentations. So I'm, I'm really interested to hear what these current folks have to say about it. I'm going to introduce all three, and then we'll have all three short presentations, and hopefully we'll have time for some discussion. Uh, so we have Mitchell Akiyama, who is an assistant professor of visual studies at the University of Toronto. We have Debashi Sinha who's an assistant professor in production and music at Toronto Metropolitan University. And we have my dear colleague, Paul Teberge, uh, who's a professor and former Canada Research Chair in Music and Interdisciplinary Studies here at Carleton University. So welcome all. Um, Mitchell, I'm gonna go ahead and spotlight you and then you can share if you like and take it away. Uh... So many prompts and menus. Okay, hi. Um, hi, everyone. It's so nice to see a lot of familiar faces and to see and meet people whose work I've been reading for years. And uh, Ellen, I have to say, you are a virtuosic Zoom host. <laughs> this is not an easy thing to do and to keep on track. And it's been really lovely. Um, so uh, I. I guess I didn't really clock the thing about technology. So I think it's implicit in what I'll be talking about, but you know, uh, maybe I'll just try and bring that out a bit more than I meant to. So uh, let's see here. Feel free to, to say exactly what you plan to say, Mitchell. <laughs> um, what happens when I do this? Are you all seeing my, uh, my screen okay? Yep, we are, yep. Okay, good, whoops. Oh, but wait, how do I, oh. Okay, I don't my, have my notes now, though. Ah, whatever. Um, so I guess what I wanted to talk to, uh, it, it, I'm really glad that uh, Dylan and Michael started out by talking about soundscapes of uh, the Vancouver Soundscape Project, because um, the, the material that I feel more comfortable with is the Soundscapes of Canada series from 1974 that is a really central part of the, the manuscript I'm uh, in the process of working of, um, it's under review right now and some work I've, I've been doing for a while. Um, so I wanna mainly talk about sound and the function that sound has in creating, maintaining or uh, reifying community. <clears throat> um, so I should start by saying that I, I actually TA'd for Schaefer in 2005. He was giving a class at Concordia uh, it's the, it was just this big service course that all the fine art students have to take. Um, and I was doing my MFA and the, it was pretty wild. It was, uh, it was called Theater of the Senses, I think. And there were like 400 undergrads who uh, created a, 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 a multi-sensory theatrical experience. Uh, and it was really fun and really wild. And I didn't really know much about him at all. Like I knew about his stature as a composer. Um, I didn't really know his music very well. I, I, it was 2005, so the, you know, the sound studies moment hadn't really crested yet, um, and I wasn't even aware of that stuff. And it was only when I started, to, I, I was asked to do an essay or to write an essay on kind of like the sonic equivalent of landscape, um, and I had no idea about the soundscape or anything of that, and in researching that essay, I learned about how this guy had worked for um, was a, a, a super influential central figure to that discourse that was uh, emerging at the time in sound studies. Um, and so one of the things that when I, I got to the Soundscapes of Canada project, which felt really central to the work I was doing, because I, I, I wrote my dissertation on field recording, and uh, the book that I'm working on now is, is uh, an adaptation of that. And what I was thinking about in field recording is the way that we think of a, a field recording as being linked to a time and a place in a way that a studio recording isn't. Like a studio recording, you have the impression that you're hearing sound coming out of your speakers that is being generated for you in that moment. Whereas in a field recording, it's it's it holds time and space and history in a way that I think that studio recordings do as well, but there's an effort to kind of purge them of that placefulness and that that timeliness. Um, and so I thought that the Soundscapes of Canada series was a really interesting, was really interesting in terms of field recording, in terms of what Schaefer and the World Soundscape Project said was on those recordings and what they were meant to do 
in a national context. So um, yeah, I think it's it's important to gather a bunch of different th themes and threads that were um, really much very much in play at that at that time. Um, so I, I like to read or think about that series through the context of Benedict Anderson's project and Imagine, Imagine Communities about the way that a nation coheres and comes together around sets of, uh, of shared values, you know, supposedly shared values that are propagated through, through media, through uh, language, through, uh, and one of the, the aspects that I don't often see picked up on in Anderson is this idea that there's a sort of sonic component to nation building. Um, so Anderson was talking more specifically about national anthems and things like that. Um, but this Soundscapes of Canada program, so it was a 10 part series. Um, and the, the frame of it was that members of the World Sound Soundscape Project, uh, mainly Peter Hughes and uh, Bruce Davis traveled all across the country gathering sonic material to give this sonic portrait of the country. And each episode was, was quite different. Um, uh, <clears throat> but what I what struck me about that series was that it was a very particular kind of portrait of Canada. And I, I really appreciate the way that um, Dylan and Michael earlier were talking about silence and silencing, because what struck me was how much was left out of that and what was privileged um, and what kind of sense of what who and who a Canadian subject, a proper Canadian subject uh, was at the time and, and should be. Um, now, I, I know we're all sort of skirting and, and, and talking around, um, like we all have our, our takes on the problematic stuff that Schaefer wrote and espoused in his, in his time. And I'm, I'm not so much interested in like trying to determine whether he was racist or, if, or to what degree he was or whether he was a product of his time, et cetera. I think that honing in on the way that Schaefer talked about race and nationhood and belonging and all that stuff in that period is a really interesting snapshot of um, a, a sort of diagnostic snapshot of what was, you know, in the air and was part of the, the, the cultural discourse at the moment. So I think it's important to, you know, we, I, I, for those of, of you who haven't read a lot of his work, there's some really really difficult stuff in there. And I, I meant to say, sorry, to start uh, that I'm, you know, I'm joining you from Toronto, from Toronto, from the ancestral lands of the Huron-Wendat, the Senecas and the, the Mississaugas of the Credit. And, you know, this is where we have, I think, rightfully, and, and I'm so happy that we're having, we have a more um, intentional conversation about land and about settler uh, colonial histories and stuff like that. Um, but you know, I think it's also important to to not just to do that work in the present, but to be historians of that narrative and the ways that that narrative is manifested um, over in different in different media and in uh, different periods of time. So, yeah, some of the stuff stuff that Schaefer wrote is 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 pretty horrifying, and I know that he was being provocative. I know that I think uh, I like to think of how McLuhan thought of provocative. Um, gestures as he, he called them probes. And I, I've always taken a lot of what Schaefer wrote as a, a kind of a probe. You know, you put it out into the world to see what happens. Um, you don't necessarily stand behind it, but it, it just making something happen is worth doing. But when the things that are worth, you know, prodding at are things like this idea that, well, in this quote, for example, the Canadian climate is our best unifier, transcending ethnic extraction or allegiance of any other kind. We are all Northerners sharing a million acres of, wild, of wildness in the imagination. That is our only uncounterfeit resource and we should seek to draw more directly from it. I mean, <laughs> are we all Northerners? Like those of us who've arrived from, uh, from Somalia, those of us who have arrived from uh, Southern Italy, uh, that, that we don't become Northerners by, by virtue of being here. And there's a really interesting and problematic link to this, uh, a long arc of Canadian history that basically Imagines, and so I'm thinking of um, uh, uh, Carl uh, Berger's essay, To, to the Truth of Strong and Free from the 60s, which is really brilliantly, he brilliantly unpacks the idea that uh, part of the Canadian ethos and mythos, uh, mythos rather than ethos, is that Canadians are a Northern European Scandinavian people, and that anybody who comes here is either not going to make it because their Southern temperament is going to be. Uh, 
extinguished <laughs> by the cold, or they're going to have that sort of virtuous uh, part of them amplified by virtue of being in the cold. And, you know, it's, it's obviously quite problematic, but I think that there's a really, this is what Schaefer is drawing on. I don't know how consciously he was, but, um, you know, we see further in that same essay, uh, uh, this was alluded to earlier that he thought Canada's already overpopulated. Uh, people who live at cities would agree with him and sooner or later the rest of will be forced to agree. And then Canadian culture will turn in on itself to produce its most original and perfected works, to turn inward, to tap the deepest resources. Um, and I think this really speaks to what Dylan and Michael were talking about, about the idea of, uh, well, like Dylan was talking about being in the, in the forest and having yourself reflected back to you. But the thing is, it's <laughs> you're having your settler self reflected back to you rather than uh, having a revelation of connection to an indigenous context to the land that you're on. So I find this to be really problematic. And, and I think that this is really manifest in this series. Um, so uh, a lot of the work just sort of presumes that the person who's listening is uh, an Anglophone or Francophone white settler. Um, and it's, I think it's really important to point out, this is 1974, so the, multi, uh, the Multicultural Act became policy in the Canadian um, constitution in, the, in 1971. Um, and then uh, by 1970, I believe, uh, immigration from non-European countries was on par with immigration from European countries. And, and after that, uh, non-European immigration has far outstripped European immigration ever since. So, you know, when you hear, um, so this, this episode of the program, uh, the, the, the gambit is that as Hughes and, and Davis went across the country, uh, asking for directions to sound marks. Um, they recorded them these directions and then um, they made a piece about the accent. So this is what Schaefer had to say in the introduction. Um, let me know if you can hear this because I didn't see a sound sharing option. As you listen, you'll discover what the speakers oh, say good. is less important than the way they say it. So you'll be listening most of all to the accents of the speech. And that of course is exactly what Peter Boos intended when he joined these hundreds of voices together and they are marvelous accents. I wonder if you'll discover your own among them. So when he says, I wonder if you'll discover your own, I know he doesn't mean it this way, but it sounds like a rhetorical question because uh, the only accents that you hear in this episode are English and, fr and French. Um, so what about uh, my Japanese grandmother? Or um, you know, what about... Uh, all the other people from different language groups who had been in Canada for quite some time by that point. Um, and then um, it's interesting, whoops, the uh, Vancouver Soundscape project actually is quite a lot more diverse uh, in the recordings. Um, I've listened to Soundscapes of Canada many times and I've only heard, there are very, very few um, non-English French speakers in the entire series, all 10 hours. Um, one, like the, the first instance of hearing a non-English speaker happens in the first program, so I'll play that. This place is called Kekrik. On a kind of a creek down here, the, it's cool water. Kekrik. So I, I think it's worth pointing out that, you know, the, the first, the first, uh, this is, um, uh, the first person you hear speaking a language other than English, he's, he's translating place names into, um, I can't remember if it's Salish or, uh, um, sorry, I don't have my notes now, so I can't get that right. But uh, I, th I think it's really telling that the that the that engagement isn't just this language on its own terms, it's a mediation of the settler colonial um, place names and, and land into a settler language. So uh, I realize I'm kind of a bit over time here. Um, I'll just quickly go to, uh, so yeah, and then the, the sound marks. Oh, um, so I, like, I think that the, 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 the subject that you were meant to identify in that, this white settler subject, it, it, to me, this, uh, this, this series felt like a really, feels like a really, not desperate, but kind of a, a there's this low grade terror of, the country turning into something other than what it was, which was being 
presented as the sort of natural condition of the country that this this industrial settler um, uh, society that whose rural uh, presence was prioritized and, and, and valorized by by Schaefer, uh, as you know, we see this in other writing from the group, like this this comment about uh, gentrification from Bruce Davis and Peter Hughes, like that's that runs all through this material. Uh, like they they talk about how they didn't bother going to Toronto or to other cities because it's too noisy, and why would you want to do that when the authentic soul of the nation is in these sort of settler uh, sound marks. And you see that in these images too. Like the, the, there's, it's not so much that there's a, a silent, a, a deliberate, obvious silencing of non-settler peoples, but I find that their lack of inclusion at this moment is is a, a real symptom of uh, the kind of Canadian subject that was being um, promoted at, at that time. So I'll, I, sorry for going over a bit, but I will uh, stop there. And I'm looking forward to talking with. Paul and Deb. Okay, thank you so much, Mitchell. Um, a really useful talk. Um, and we'll continue right along with Deb. We'll ask you to put your video on. There you go. It's easier to see ya <laughs> for me to spotlight you. Okay, you're spotlit and you can go ahead and uh, share if you like. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, hopefully you can hear me. I think you can. The little green thingy is jumping. Yeah, should be good. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen here and talk through it. Uh, hopefully you can see a large thing that says offering one oranges. Yep. Uh, not my presenter notes. Um, uh, thank you very much. It's been a, an amazing uh, day for me. And uh, I just want to introduce myself. My name is Deb, Deb Shi Sinha. I'm an assistant professor at Toronto Metropolitan University in the production, performance and professional music programs. And I am a, a new academic. I've come to all this uh, in a slightly different way, I think maybe. And my relationship with sound has uh, led to a bunch of different possible places for me to work. And so I've done a lot of different things. Um, oh, I'm going to just paste a thing in the chat. Goes, today's about te technology. And I do a lot of work with machine learning and sound, but I'm actually going to be talking about field recording. So Mitchell, I'll be ordering your book immediately um, as soon as it's out. Um, yeah, so uh, field recording was something that ha kind of happened to me by accident. Um, I was literally going out the door in my late teens, early 20s, and I grabbed a recorder. I had a cassette recorder, a uh, portable cassette recorder that could record, which was the height of technology at the time, uh, because I was heading to Kolkata, uh, India, where a lot of my family is. And I had this idea that I wanted to record sound. And of course, at the time, there was we didn't have the digital audio tools that we do there, and I didn't know what I was going to do with them, but I was compelled to do this. Uh, so the idea of field recording was not something I was familiar with. I didn't know anything about the World Soundscape Project. I didn't know anything about sound art. I just knew about music. I was playing drums. So this idea of instinct and instinctual um, action is something that's kind of informed uh, my work in this domain. And uh, as my archive of recordings grew, uh, archive of recordings of Kolkata and various places in Southeast Asia grew over my travels, I started to kind of think about the city and uh, uh, as less of a, a particular place that my listening body was situated in and more as a kind of, I don't want to say object, but just something that had its own logic and own story. And I, you can see this kind of, um, uh, this is from a libretto, uh, I call it a libretto from a sound piece that I, I made called In the City, The Body Rests. And this idea of the city kind of having its own thing going on outside of my hearing it uh, began to take shape in, in, in sound, but uh, I began to appreciate the many facets of city-ness. Um, so uh, as I said, I do a lot of work with machine learning and sound and cultural transmission and speculative mythology. And I posted that link in the chat. Um, but today I wanna to talk about field recording. And in fact, I wanna talk about a very early work of mine because I think it's interesting and, and I, I feel like I'm still thinking about the same things today. So again, just kind of tangential to the World Soundscape Project because what happened was I had I'd done these recordings and I had, oh damn, I forgot to turn on the timer. 
Uh, anyway, I had done these recordings and I started working with them and I sent them along to Darren Copeland and Nadine Terrio Copeland, uh, who run uh, New Adventures in Sound Art. Who, they were located in Toronto at the time. And I sent them the CD and they called me back and they were like, who are you? What is what is happening? Who are you? And I went over and they introduced me to all this work. So the the field recording kind of came first, and then I started becoming more familiar with the with the sonic landscape of study. Um, this piece is um, thank you, Ellen. This piece is a very early one, and it it documents uh, an encounter I had with an itinerant singing sadhu in in um, outside of Hara Station in Kolkata, and um, you know, I think it kind of demonstrates some of the things that I think about when I work with sound and I encounter sound in cities, which I love cities and I love how they sound. You know, this polyphonic storytelling that cities hold, um, how field recording documents the encounter in the moment, but also uh, on the listening back and the removal of the recording from the place and to listen to it later. I think, Mitchell, you're talking a little bit about that. So this, this kind of potential for deeper engagement in building an archive and building an archive yourself, I think is really important. Um, eh, and I think also, you know, accepting that cities are part of the soundscape of many, 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 many people. And it, they have a, a lot of lessons for us. Um, I don't wanna talk too much more. I want us to actually listen. I made a, like a little video of the beginning of this piece that we can listen to together and uh, there's no images so just uh, ha ha have, a have a listen. I'll press play, that'll work. Hopefully you can hear this. Thank you, Gassia. Um, I I think about this work, you know, and the work I do uh, now with machine learning and 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 sound installations and stuff. 
about kind of an, an imagining or an investigation of the gaps in my own knowledge, my own connection with my own heritage. You know, I grew up in, in Winnipeg on Treaty 1 territory, and uh, it was a time, you know, before the internet where our communities were very small. I knew all the brown people in Winnipeg, you know, so there were a lot of gaps in my knowledge because we were very separated from our family in India. And uh, I wonder uh, in these works of mine and these investigations, uh, I wonder if I'm contributing to a type of permission to ignore the many issues that the soundscape reveals in urban spaces. You know, that's one of the things, the silencing we've been speaking about, um, you know, I think also operates in uh, in cities. And, you know, this kind of seeking has, has a potential to um, elide many, much of the work that we need to do in cities. You know, the very real harm is embedded in the city and challenges of building inclusive and supportive uh, communities. Uh, you know, we talked about um, the silencing of indigenous, indigenous peoples and what cities do uh, and how they contribute to that. Um, uh, this normalization of surveillance and extraction too. field recording can be very problematic. And I, I wonder about that. I'm always questioning myself. Uh, Gassia mentioned um, urban sound environments as con contested sites. I mean, I could put notes from everybody who spoke today. Um, this deification of silence, uh, you know, there's just a lot of questions that I wrestle with that aren't necessarily directly uh, speaking to the, uh, the, the work of the World Soundscape Project, but I think are adjacent to it. And um, one of the things, as I was, uh, like I said, I'm a new academic, so I was, I'm moving all my junk, <laughs> a lot of it, over to my new office. And one of the, I came across a paper written by uh, John Draver, Dr. Draver, who we spoke, heard from earlier. And he talked about how uh, it was a 2002 paper called Soundscape Composition, The Convergence of Ethnography and Acousmatic Music. Hello, clearly written for me. Uh, and he speaks uh, about reflexive awareness and how it's so vital in the act of ethnography. And I think it's a, a lesson that we can learn when we, uh, do, yeah, great paper. It's a lesson we can learn and carry with us when we uh, work in spaces and work with technology and work with the archive that we build. Uh, and that listening and listening back as part of a constellation of care, whatever the sonic environment. I think it's something very important and something I carry and I wonder about. So yeah, thanks very much. That's me. A uh, little bit of a different take, but hopefully it was something useful. You can get in touch with me. And yeah, I look forward to the conversation coming up. Thank you very much, Deb. And and I think actually you're, you're, the way you're thinking is right at the heart of these questions of what we do with this way of what can we I can't even talk anymore. How can we use these ideas now? How do we need to be able to use these now? What, what, how do we need to learn to, to listen? And, and what aren't we hearing? Our final speaker in this session is Paul Teberge. And Paul, I think you're not sharing a screen, if I'm correct. No, no, I'm, I'm just a talking head today. But here you are, Spotlit, your lovely talking head. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I just want to start off by saying I'm, I'm really pleased to be here um, and take part in this event. Uh, I'm very, really grateful for all the interesting presentations that have happened today. Um, I'm going to focus my talk on something that's kind of historical and quite particular in, in Schaefer's work. Uh, but I think it does have a lot of resonance with what's been said today in a, in a lot of areas, um, and even with the last two speakers' work in, in some ways. So um, what I wanted to focus on uh, in, in particular in relationship to technology, is Schaefer's early formulation of the notion of schizophonia, which um, is, is another one of these problematic uh, formulations, I think, that uh, people have had trouble with, uh, especially people from popular music studies, from ethno uh, ethnography, from communication studies, media studies. Um, but it's it's kind of a peculiar idea, and I want to approach it in what it what were represented in his work, but also with the underlying implications of it. Um, so um, let me let me take on the the, the idea first. Uh, the idea of schizophrenia was uh, presented as a, pro a kind of provocation. I mean, we were asked to be provocative today. I don't want to be provocative. I want to look at Schaefer as a provocateur, 
And in this way, I'm, I'm kind of echoing, I think, uh, what was just said a few minutes ago about uh, of probes, right? McLuhan was at his height around the time when Schaefer was developing his ideas. And the idea of a probe, of just simply launching something out there that probably didn't make any sense, you know, McLuhan talked about hot and cold media and all these kinds of things, and, and nobody knew what to make of it. And in some ways, it was a strategy on his part to provoke people out of their kind of stereotypical thinking about things, thinking out of the box, thinking about received knowledge that they had. So Schaefer's in, engaged, I think, sometimes in the same way as, as a provocateur. And he, I think he, it was a role he probably gleefully played in a lot of instances in his music and his critical work and in, and in his, his pedagogy. Um, and I think there's probably no more provocative concept that comes from Schaefer than this notion of schizophrenia. Um, he describes it in The Tuning of the World as intentionally edgy, that he wanted it to be loaded with connotations and, and really be an uncomfortable term uh, in some ways, physically and mentally. It kind of provokes the notion of, I mean, it so, sounds like schizophrenia, right? It, it has a kind of connotation of physical and mental dislocation and maybe even hallucinatory and paranoia kind of behavior. Um, and it's kind of odd that he would use that term. But again, he was you know, intentionally being edgy with it. Basically, he goes back to kind of Greek, you know, the origins of these terms, and schizophrenia literally means something like split sound. But Schaefer explicitly describes it as sound split from the maker of sound. And I think it's that formulation of it, not just the Greek or, you know, the Greek split sound, but actually inserting the maker of sound into the equation, which makes it e even more problematic. And it gives it that psychological kind of connotation in some ways, because there's a, a kind of origin story for every sound. Every sound is made by someone or something. And therefore, the wrenching of that sound in his terms from, in, from its kind of socket in, in some maker is problematic and technology is, is the agent of that, that wrenching apart uh, the, of the split. Um, and it's that particular way in which he engages with it and in particular in the way that he it makes an equation between this split with technology and he's kind of, you know, it's a very general concept for him. It's not just sound recording, it's te the telephone, it's sound recording, it's radio, it's all the major early modernist media um, of the late 19th and early 20th centuries that are kind of implicated within this kind of notion of schizophrenia. Um, I think it's kind of an unfortunate term in that way because the edginess is based on this association of a, actually a, a kind of pop culture stereotype, a pop culture notion of psychoanalysis. You have to remember, in, you know, in, when he's writing these things in the 1960s and 70s, um, Pop culture is already saturated with notions of Freudian psychoanalysis that come from 1930s and 40s, the Hitchcock films, and you know, it's, it's all over the place. And in the 1970s, in particular in film theory, it's kind of the heyday of psychoanalytic theory. So you have um, people like uh, Kasia Silverman, who wrote a book called The Acoustic Mirror. Uh, and she draws on the work of psychoanalysts and French, you know, French psychoanalyst Guy Rossolato. And kind of he, Rossolato, I think for me, is, is kind of like the audio equivalent of a Lacan. He kind of tries to think of sound in the same way that Lacan thinks about the mirror phase and human development. And Silverman taps into this and develops his term acoustic mirror. So at the time that Schaefer's working on these ideas of you know, kind of schizophrenia, it, it's a very current kind of approach to sound and a very kind of um, theoretically rich one for film studies for a period of time and it was kind of to, the ex to an excess. Um, but I'm also thinking of uh, a little bit later than this, uh, people like Avital Ronell who kind of start writing a kind of poetics of sound technologies. Um, Ronell wrote a book called The Telephone Book and it's a kind of poetics of, of time and space in relationship to the telephone. She creates these kind of imaginary conversations between Freud and uh, Derrida. So there's these kinds of interesting ways in which she plays with the idea of separation in, in, in space and time. And the telephone is a particular kind of condensation of the problem of communication and the problem of speech and the problem of uh, mediated communication in particular. So at, you know, again, the, Schaefer, I think, one of the problems with the term is that he doesn't really develop it. 
he'd, he could go in the direction of a poetics or, or, or a deeper critique of the role of sound and, and sound technology, but he doesn't go very far with it. And um, in the midst of this kind of rich thinking about technology and sound and psychoanalysis, he kind of throws it out kind of like an empty, empty metaphor of some kind, uh, an empty signifier. And, and because of that, it tends to kind of get associated with some of the things that we were talking about earlier today, the, the anti-modern character of some of his work or the anti-urban. So now it's anti-technology. And I think it was perceived that way by an awful lot of people in popular music studies and in ethnography and, and that kind of thing as a kind of latter day reaction to technology. It, it, it has the ring of a lot of the criticisms that came about around radio in the 1920s and 1930s of people kind of reacting to this new technology that was in everyone's homes and the way it was dominating the, the kind of domestic space in some ways. Um, the term gets widely rejected, I think, in sound studies and other areas as sound study scholars start to kind of take up soundscapes and, and uh, sound generally in culture, um, there's a kind of almost out of necessity, people feel like they have to kind of push this particular notion of technology and sound aside. It just does not resonate with the way most people are thinking about sound. Certainly in communication studies, there's a kind of sense in which it's not just splitting sound from the maker of sound. It's not just about separation. Communications mediated technologies all play a role in connecting us as much as they do in separating us. And that's the kind of banal uh, side of, of this kind of thinking. But there is a kind of broader kind of critique of if privileging face-to-face -face communication over every type of mediated communication. And that and that's a problem. And I think um, by leaving it un undeveloped in the way that he did, um, Schaefer kind of lent it uh, the air of a kind of Luddite trope. And I think people like Barry Truax, who was you know, there from the beginning, almost a co-founder of Soundscape Studies along with Schaefer, I think Truax was at great pains in some of his work to try and counter that particular notion of technology and to have just a more even hand with how he dealt with radio and other kinds of forms of mediated communication. Um, so in this way, I think Schaefer did himself a disservice by not really kind of developing this idea and especially loading it up with the psychoanalytic baggage. Um, he really prevented himself from developing uh, a unique or even an eclectic theory of, of te technology or poetics of technology in, in relationship to sound and space and time in the ways that other people were doing at the time. The, the irony in all of this is that um, Soundscape studies as formulated by Schaefer and others at the time was completely dependent on sound recording technologies, decibel meters and all kinds of other um, uh, technologies of, of, for audio measurement and documentation. They were completely dependent on it for doing their analytic work, whether it be urban or in kind of natural surroundings, the documentation, the measurement, the preservation, the analysis, all of this was kind of based on technological means and even the creative work of Truax and other people who um, are Hildegard Westerkamp who are using some of the soundscape recordings that are in their own kind of compositional processes all kind of were dependent on one way or another around uh, audio technologies. Um, one of the things that I want to put some emphasis on here um, is this kind of notion of the maker of the sound again. There's a kind of inherent or implicit subject position, that there is a subject that produces sound. And somehow the separation again, the separation of the sound from that maker is problematic. The other implication of all this is that there is also a subject position for the listener. And it's not as clear in, in the way in which he formulates the notion of, uh, of schizophonia. But I think it's there in these early dependencies that soundscape studies had on recording technology. One of the kind of common um, tools that a lot of soundscape people have used when going out and doing field recordings is to use binaural recording techniques. And binaural recording techniques are quite peculiar in that they actually mimic the human head, right? You have sound, uh, sound recording uh, devices that are divided in such a way that you get a, a kind of equal pickup at precisely the kind of locations where your, your ears would more or less be. So binaural recording techniques actually 
posit, not just posit, but literally recreate a subject position where the recording, and if you walk around, then your, your walk is documented through the binaural process. So there's a way in which even the technologies that were being adopted by a lot of soundscape studies um, researchers were also implicated in this kind of notion of a kind of subject position of a unitary individual listener. Um, this particular idea that I'm trying to kind of work through in terms of a, a kind of subject position of, for listening as well as producing sound um, is, is kind of partly based on some uh, thoughts that um, uh, Jonathan Stern has written about. Uh, in the context of all of this, he, he kind of argues that there's a, a audio technology as much as Schaefer seems to be rejecting it with notions like schizophonia is actually deep seated in his thinking. He's almost unaware the degree to which his experience of growing up with sound recording and radio is at the heart of his un his understanding of the soundscape. He argues, uh, uh, Stern argues that um, terms like hi-fi soundscape and lo-fi soundscape uh, not only drew on popular terminology uh, that was you know, current at the time around sound recording, but also it informs his listening practice, again, as a kind of singular subject position. It's like an individual in a landscape taking in sound. Um, and to, to me, that kind of is very reminiscent of a 19th century painting. And I'm thinking of these paintings, not the early, late 18th and early 19th century paintings where people, you know, wealthy aristocrats are sitting, you know, in front of their, their property and our, you know, their ownership of that property is kind of implied in their position and with it. But kind of later 19th century, mid 19th century painting where the individuals are lost in these enormous landscapes. Um, and it seems to me that the kind of Schaefer model of a listener in the soundscape is like that 19th century painting. Um, more to, to Stern's kind of notion of, of Schaefer in the soundscape is that he understands what Schaefer is positing there as kind of analogous to um, the subject position of someone sitting in a stereo, the, the sweet spot of listening to a stereo a concert you know being reproduced on stereo so that there's a kind of way of again like taking in the 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 space created by the stereo field in the same way that Schaefer is, is talking about the landscape so there's a kind of way in which Stern understands technology and playback systems and hi-fi systems as being at really at the heart of Schaefer's thinking about what a soundscape is and in particular his subject position in relationship to it um, as a kind of aside, but I don't think it's a side so much. I mean, in reference to a lot of the discussions we've been having today about um, acknowledging indigenous uh, land and the, the lands that we all occupy, it seems to me that Schaefer's concept of the subject as maker of sound and the individual subject as listener is problematic at a lot of levels. But in particular, um, there's a way in which in this work, uh, it kind of dovetails with his ideas about this natural soundscape. The natural soundscape is essentially unpopulated. And that's a kind of settler idea that you enter into this and you are the individual, you take it in for the first time, it seems, because these, these, these places are pristine, they're untouched. And that, that's a kind of peculiar kind of settler idea, but just effacing the presence of indigenous cultures um, that have you know, occupied these lands for, for so long. Um, and it's very kind of similar, I think. Uh, there's a, I'm thinking here of, of some work that's been done in photography, actually. Uh, there's a book called River of Shadows, I think. Um, it's by a, a woman, Rebecca Solnit. And it's a, it's a kind of book about Edward Mybridge, the, the early photographer, late 19th, early 20th century photographer, and how he created a, a technological vision of the Wild West. And he would go out with his you know, photographic equipment and, and photograph these forests, these, these prairies, these, these open um, uh, abandoned spaces. Um, and that there's actually documents of some of the places of people going back to where he planted his camera to take some of these photographs and photographs of, of around the same time that he did them, where he actually frames the photographs so that you see some mountain or some forest and uh, some river. Um, and it's framed in such a way that you miss the indigenous village that's at the bottom of the valley. Uh, so it's a kind of very kind of conscious framing 
of the West as unpopulated, as wild, as open space for occupation by, by white settlers. So it's a, it's a so that, and, and not just white settlers, but even uh, it was a, these photographs were used in the creation of things like Yosemite Park, you know, the, the, the national, on the one hand, there's the, the impulse to occupy those abandoned lands or those open lands. And the other impulse is to create uh, refuges where no one can, uh, national parks where nobody can occupy them, where they, they retain their pristine wilderness status. So the, the photography was actively involved in kind of creating this myth of the American West. And it seems to me that something about the way that Schaefer in, encounters the, the soundscape, either whether with this, within the um, work that he did in making recordings and kind of charting the, the, the yearly changes in the sonic kind of character of, of woodlands, or in his environmental music works, perhaps, and you know, locating them out in you know, lakes and places where there is no one to be you know, in, in the area. Uh, there's a kind of way in which he kind of echoes that type of um, concept of the pristine wilderness. And it's embedded, I think, for me, in this, the way that this subject position of the listener is articulated technologically. So there's something equivalent there to, to this early photographic work. Um, to come back to the, the, the individual listener, though, as a subject um, within not just nature, but within urban spaces as well, um, it seems to me one of the things that is problematic in this maker of sound is that there isn't actually a kind of, it, it implies that there's a body that is a maker of the sound and that the listener is also a body, but it's not ter terribly explicit. And I think what goes on in Schaefer's work is, is kind of a, a concentration on the ear much of the time. And I think in popular music studies, especially in, especially in uh, attempts to map the modern city, that, I, that some of the work that I'm thinking of in, uh, has kind of measured not just street noise, the way that the early soundscape studies uh, tended to do, but also understands neighborhoods as complex social and sonic environments. Uh, where music and everyday life intertwine in kind of complex ways. And, and I think this is kind of reminiscent of what uh, Deb Sinna was just talking about, uh, this polyphonic notion of an urban, uh, urban environment. Is that there's work uh, uh, that I think has kind of come along since the earlier days of soundscape study that's trying to understand the city in, in much more social terms rather than just as a soundscape, or, you know, a problematic, noisy soundscape. And I'm thinking here primarily of work that it's been around now for quite a few years, uh, like J Julian Enrique's, his account of the reggae sound system, for instance, is quite interesting. And I, I don't know how Schaefer would have reacted to his work. The sound system is, is a kind of technology that carves out you know, in a unique way, a kind of space within the urban environment where communal activities, dancing and that kind of thing can happen. And it's really based on really highly amplified music. So I don't think Schaefer would have you know, liked it very much. Um, but what's interesting about Enrique's work is that he, you know, he says that there's actually, it's not only just loud, there's a kind of concept of, of dominance, right? Of sonic dominance that has to come into play for the reggae sound system to work in the ways it does. And it's not just about hearing, it's not just about a soundscape as such, but it's about the enormous pressure on the body that loud bass sounds can, can uh, create. And it's the pressure on dancing bodies and the ways in which the sound system creates a kind of a kind of closed space that's intense in a way that other parts of the environment are not. Uh, and I think this, you know, this you know, the sound system is no soniferous garden, as, as Schaefer thought of it. I mean, Schaefer, the urban planner side of him, in the, the half the book uh, says. Uh, the um, tuning of the world is de dedicated to his aspirations and uh, as a composer that composers should be handed over urban environments to to create these kind of more humane spaces. Uh, so the sound system is not a Sunniferous garden. If anything, it's not a refuge in the city. Uh, I don't think Enrique thinks of it as a refuge even. It's about a popular carving out of space and a communal expression of what that space is supposed to be about. Um, and it's carved out in this way out of necessity because of the noise of the city, but out of aesthetic pre preference as well. It's kind of as asserts its own sonic, sonic dominance within the, the soundscape of the city. Um, I, I'm not sure what time I have left here. Maybe we're, we're, we only have a few minutes for questions, okay. Paul, so you should probably yeah. wrap up. Uh, let me just wrap up then. Um, 
I think Schaefer's notion of schistophonia is, is intended to be provocative, as I said before. And ironically, I think it's been largely rejected by a lot of subsequent people working in soundscape studies and in sound st studies generally, researchers in a lot of different fields. And by many creative individuals, people, not just theorists, but people who want to work with sound and, and environmental sound in their musical work, have to somehow get beyond this, this particular attitude towards technology that, that's in, kind of encapsulated in that, that term. But you know, it seems to me that rather than simply rejecting it, um, I think the idea of split sound and its basic kind of translation uh, from the Greek might still be useful if we consider it in broader terms, in terms of conceptualizing different relationships between absence and presence, between sound production and sound reception. Uh, you know, a kind of po poetics of sound, a poetics of sound that focuses on the varying roles that technology can play in creating and enhancing and enhancing spatial relationships, rather than think of technology as an intruder or, as a, or you know, a break in the natural order of things. Um, broader still, I think the, the the singular subject position that I was kind of arguing uh, for in terms of both you know making and, and listening to sound that's implied in that in that idea of schizophrenia is something that we have to kind of give some kind of consideration to and, and kind of think about beyond it in terms of like Enrique's uh, collective and communal and and maybe non-human forms of sound making. You know, a lot of work, current work has has gone in that direction, but. It, I, it, it, it seems to me that still the, the, the idea of schizophrenia needs to be kind of thought of in relationship to this new work and how it might inform it or you know, oppose it or what have you. In particular, it, to get away from that individualization of exp the experience of sound towards a kind of more social space and a more of a kind of less idealized male, male, male subject to a kind of broader kind of different kind of diffuse listener. Okay, I'll just drop it up, drop it there. Thank you, thank you. That was just fantastic. So you just write that up into a nice book chapter and we'll be all done. <laughs> all right, so we'll take a few minutes for questions because um, we these are very strong. Yeah, again, fascinating presentations, but uh, we won't go too far over the hour, just maybe five minutes because uh, we, we have three more presentations in the day and uh, I think all of our uh, last presenters have been with us all day, which is a really quite amazing thing. So I'm going to spotlight the three of you and oh, that didn't work. Okay. Uh, and, and if anyone has a particular question, you could please put it in the chat so that we can we can um, Sorry, it's really getting increasingly hard to multitask as the day goes on. Okay, here we are. <laughs> All right. Uh, so Jake Williams has a comment. Um, Thanks for the fascinating talk, Saul. Picking up on Paul's comments about Enrique, I was wondering if anyone had any thoughts on the more day-to-day -day playing of recorded music in the urban soundscape. It seems like an intrinsic part, but requires understanding of both urban politics and urban structures and the music itself to understand. So I wondered, um, you know, who would like to pick that up? Um, it's funny because I was just uh, the other day with my kid and I was walking and we were talking about urban noise or something for some reason. And I was thinking about that chapter in Emily Thompson's book uh, where she talks about that there's this violinist who uh, whose neighbor is complaining about the noise and they go to court and this is like in the 20s or 30s or something and uh, the violinist plays for the judge and the jury and they're like it's so beautiful this isn't noise <laughs> go away and they drop the case and I, I think that it's it's music is such an interesting sort of hinge because you know if it's your block party it's the greatest thing ever and it includes certain people um that might be like a racialized community. It might be geographic, like, you know, neighborhood base. Um, and then some people find it really irritating. And it's, you can, I think you can decode so many prevailing cultural attitudes just by throwing some sort of music in a space and seeing how people react because, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's such an important uniter, but it's also such a, uh, an inflection point for for dissensus and, and discord. 
<laughs> I had students uh, a, a few years ago, uh, many years ago at the University of Guelph, who put a boombox in the cafeteria of the student center and and they they played pop music on it first and people stuck around and they played Schaefer's music and people <laughs> objected and moved away. <laughs> Deb, I wonder if you have something to add about this. This, uh, yeah, it's interesting. Well, I posted that link to Sonic Street Technologies, which uh, investigates sound systems all over the world, and that's one thing. But uh, music in the environment is very interesting. There's, uh, you know, my trips to India. There's always PA systems blaring uh, music all over the place, and I find it very comforting and part of the soundscape that, uh, for me, because I'm seeking nostalgia, maybe. Uh, or I have this kind of uh, underlying um, des desire to to find something there that I don't find here. Uh, I find it very comforting. I also find it interesting because I kind of listen differently in different spaces. And, and the kind of uh, listening uh, body that I bring to my travels is a very different listening body than I bring home. I think if somebody was blaring... 1970s music over a, a crappy you know megaphone speaker n next door to my house i would probably feel very different so it's a yeah it, 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 for the, to your point mitchell about how it kind of yeah it's a real um it's a real great way to find out what people around you are like i guess but yeah, just to, to speak to that again, I, mean, I think there is a real difference between being inside the sound system and being outside the sound system. Mm -hmm. You have a different perspective on it. But you know, the prevalence of music in, in cities is incredible. In, in most, um, a lot of the early soundscape studies of, of cities and different worlds, the, the, the marketplace, getting in and out of a cab, there's all this music just everywhere. Here, there's a kind of power dimension to it as well. The, you know, Jonathan Stern's work again is, is that famous Mall of America piece where he talks about the way the whole mall has been designed as a kind of sound system. And there's mic uh, there's music being piped in no matter where you are in, in the mall. Some of the shops have their own music, but as soon as you step out of there, you're still in the, it kind of asserts the, the ownership of the space in some ways uh, as being in the hands of the mall owners. So it's a, it's a kind of contradictory bunch of spaces depending on the context. And, and that that question of context has come up many times today how you know everything as we know happens in the context i thought another thing that that um linked your three talks was this combination of technology affect and imagination and and that's not really a, a well formulated question at all but but i wonder i wonder about that role of affect in in, in, for example, Mitchell, in field recordings, I know ones I've made myself, and Deb, this came out very strongly in your piece, you know, um, they are incredibly evocative. You, you turn them on and you're transported right back to that space. But as Hildegard Westerkamp once wrote in an essay about uh, recording from uh, the back of a camel in, in India, you know, she was missing the experience substantially by having her headphones on and her microphone and, and, and being, you know, so the very thing she was trying to capture was something that was already at a remove from her. So I wonder whether you might want to have anything to say about that sense of affect. This is maybe less about affect, but more. So I, I do this exercise in when I do sound classes where I have them um, make, a th they, I have them take out a recorder and and listen to the sound in real time through the microphone and the headphones. And then I have them listen back to the recording. And then we go on a sound walk and I have them mm -hmm. basically, I, I have this meditation where I, I propose that they become sound recorders because a sound recorder, even a field recording with a really good stereo microphone, it gives you the illusion of being transported, but it also still flattens things. Like your the the cocktail party effect is, is much less strong. So the, the 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 provocation is like, can you have a relationship to sound like to unmediated sound? You know, not coming through a microphone um, that is. Uh, separated from your interest as a psychoacoustic subject, like can you, can, what can we learn about the act of listening by being more like a machine? Not because it's a, a better condition of listening, but um, because I, like there are different these different modalities of, of listening, and I think that when we, until we just like try to dislodge 
our our you know subjective centered uh, mind bot split mind bodies um, sovereign subject kind of body into something else we don't really understand how that operates so it's I find it to be a really useful exercise um, but defamiliarization with my own kind of faculty of listening that, that actually sounds like you're deconstructing schizophrenia in a, in a very important way oh yeah there's a, a many pages in the book about that <laughs> many, 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 many. <laughs> <laughs> and and Deb, any anything to add to that before we move on? Uh, well, I mean, affect. I think in general uh, drives so much of my understanding of what I'm listening to, and I think it's because it's related to this cultural seeking or whatever. And um, I am interested in that in some ways uh, because I think it kind of points a way to. Um, thinking about culture and how it operates, at least in my own experience. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's just something that I find very inspiring. And uh, but I also kind of want to be free of it somehow. I, but I'm not sure how what that process is or, or when that'll happen, if, if ever. I wanted to ask you because I mean, the, this question about effort was kind of interesting in relationship with, to what you were saying earlier, because you were talking about how you wanted to use these recordings to get at things that you would not normally hear, right? So it's not like your interest driving the recordings, actually trying to get outside yourself at some, at some level and let the microphone do the work and then experience it after, I guess, uh, as something new. Is that, does that make sense? I think, you know, uh, one, you know, at some point, sometimes like when I was on those trips, sometimes I would actually go, okay, I need to document this or whatever. And it always felt wrong. It always felt wrong to press record in those when I had that uh, impulse. And so I learned very, uh, uh, very early to allow my instinct to let me start recording. And I think that's very interesting. That's something worth unpacking. Uh, I mentioned earlier in a chat earlier uh, about um, A.M. Kangi's uh, doing a, a residency somewhere and they went to the forest to record and they asked permission of the forest and sometimes the forest didn't give permission. And I tried that out and I, I think that's a really interesting um, idea. I think all my recordings have come from some kind of intent and I don't know what that intent was to start recording. And I, and I still don't know what it is when I listen back but I do know when it feels wrong, like when I've not used that intent to start recording, you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. I wonder if, you know, I'm not sure what I'm looking for when I do uh, record, I think. I don't know if that answers your question, but. No, yeah, no, that's, it's, I mean, it's kind of the opposite of what I think Ellen was going for, but it's a kind of very different, you know, it's it's not you know, getting the intention away from it, which is I think very much at the core of a lot of soundscape studies. You know? sure. Thank you very much to the three of you, and and um, I'll just throw in at the the tail end of there in Gassia's talk, where she was talking about her students who are trying to figure out how to ethically do field recording. Um, so the, lots of connections across the the sessions today. I, I wanted to know more about what 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 were they doing uh, with that. Okay, we'll we'll move on to our last session. But again, please join me in thanking um, Deb and Mitchell and Paul for a very stimulating session. Um, it's been really exciting material. And Mitchell, we really look forward to the book. Okay. Well, we're down to that that magic hour, the the last hour of a conference, um, which is always a, a kind of a tricky time. It's a very it's a it's not a great slot in the gig to get as a speaker. Um, so I really really appreciate Garth and David and and Jeremy for for sticking with us uh, through everything. But I also want to say that this is where I think this session is where um, the crux of what interested me in putting this symposium together occurs. I always have this this kind of kind of recent statement of Donna Haraway in my mind. You know, she's she's riffing off of Isabel Stenger's work when she says that it matters what thoughts think thoughts. It matters what knowledges know knowledges. It matters what relations relate relations. It matters what worlds world worlds. 
And she's saying in her usual poetic way that the ideas we work with have a character and for them to be efficacious, for them to do good work in the world, they, they, we have to, you know, really consider, are they good to think with? Is Schaefer's work still good to think with? And how can it be efficacious in the face of large issues that we're dealing with? Climate crisis, indigenous rights, Black Lives Matter, social justice issues more generally. Um, uh, we could go on and on. Uh, now I've sort of set you up for a very heavy session uh, and you may all just be talking about something quite different. So uh, don't feel you have to shift gears. Uh, I'll start again by reading um, all of your bios and then we'll dive in with uh, our first presentation. So Garth Payne is professor at Arizona State University. Uh, he's a composer and acoustic ecologist and co-director with Sabine Feist of the Acoustic Ecology Lab. Jeremy Strawn um, is a, 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 an amazing co community engaged scholar. Uh, the depth of the work you're doing is, is really amazing. He was a Banting postdoctoral fellow quite recently, um, a musicologist, teaches at Carleton University and University of Ottawa. And his specialty really is this relationship between music and settler colonialism. But the work that is really um, had me invite you today, Jeremy, um, you're an expert on experimental music in Canada, and you have been giving a ton of time to this accountability for change council at the Canada Music, um, it's Canadian Music Centre. And then our dear colleague, great musician and uh, a teaching and learning librarian, but also with his virtuosic switching of hats uh, of a really fine sound studies scholar, David Jackson. Uh, here at Carleton. So, Garth, I'm going to spotlight you and you can take it away. Okay, wonderful. Hopefully you can hear me and yes. I will uh, share my screen. Let me just work out where that is. You have really rather nice mountains behind you. Indeed, we're down on the, on the border. <laughs> um, with Mexico. Hopefully you can now see my slides. Yes. Great, thank you. Um, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, modalities of listening and I'm going to tie that back to community engagement, uh, which is a really key tenant in what I've proposed as Acoustic Ecology 2.0. Um, before I start though, I'd like to express my gratitude to Ellen for the invitation to the Music Sound and Society in Canada Research Group for making this incredible day happen and it's been Ellen really refreshing to hear the perspectives today um, but I'd also like to pay my gratitude to the Indigenous peoples of the land on which we are all residing. So uh, let me just make sure there we go oh no too far. Um, so I want to talk about ecological listening and I want to talk about that using a frame of a uh, Tibetan Buddhist frame of dependent arising. So Tibetan Buddhism teaches us that dependent arising uh, is a descriptor or a way of thinking through the fact that phenomena have no intrinsic existence. The frame of dependent arising might be applied to a car where we can look for the essence of car and what we find are like bolts and wheels and steering wheels and plastic and steel, but we don't really find car. Equally, we could think about the loaf of bread, and we, when we try to inquire into the loaf of bread, we find wheat and yeast and salt and so on. But we also find farmers and shopkeepers and bakers and millers and truck drivers and so on. So all of these things only come into existence through all of the interdependent and interrelated connections that bring them into our lives. And so if we think about ecological listening in this way, then we no longer think about sound as a signifier. We're not just thinking about sound as material, as we might in art or in composition. We're not just thinking about sound as data. We're no longer just thinking about sound as voice. We're not even thinking about sound as atmosphere or as context. But we're thinking about sound then as fundamentally ecosystemic. 
So sound is really a unique form of experience or perception. It forms this amazing gestalt, a singular expression of all existence, a cumulative expression of the now, a kind of snapshot that contains many of the interdependencies that are present, whether we perceive them or not. And interestingly, it's a phen phenomena that's both in time and perhaps uniquely we can only listen in the now, but also timeless. And I don't have time to fill out that, <laughs> but to say that we have a kind of accumulation of sonic conditioning. If I ask you to close your eyes and go to a place that you like the sound of, you can go there instantly. Simil sim similarly, if we go to a concert, for instance, um, an opera, we'll come out with this kind of singular sensation of the entire opera. So we can apply time in its performance or in its unpacking in our discussion with our friends, but time doesn't necessarily have to be an inherent part of that experience. And I think the way that we hold those sonic experiences is really important and the factor of time is an important one uh, there. So why does this all matter? Well, acoustic ecology, I think the term acoustic ecology encapsulates all of these ideas to listen to the whole. It encapsulates the notion of interdependence, of coexistence, of codependencies. And I love to come back to Stephen Feld here and his phenomenological discussions where he talks of sensing place. And just to quote, I'm sure you all know this quote, but as place is sensed, senses are placed, as places make sense, senses make place. And I see this as a really beautiful and poetic way of talking about those interdependencies that bring into reality our presence in any place. His term acoustemology takes that perhaps a little bit further in terms of talking about one sonic way of knowing and being in the world. And he says, sensation of sound is a special kind of Garth I don't know if it's just me but suddenly you're quiet is no lenses through which we look but a single common domain which arises dependent on all the other phenomena a special kind of knowing as Feld would say expressed uniquely through sound. Our thinking, of course, gets us into trouble. It establishes a thus and them. It establishes a kind of exceptionalism, a vertical hierarchy, an externalization of objects, sounding sources, and so on, which has been the source of much of today's discussion. And as a way of trying to break that down, in 2014, I uh, was giving a keynote at the Ecomusicologies Conference and introduced a term somaphony, meaning soma as in subtle body and phony as in sound. So rather than thinking about our terminologies, which are descriptive of sounding sources, to think about the phenomenology of reception, the knowledge in the body, the way that sound experience accumulates in the body. So in this sense, we're thinking about subtle body listening, whole body listening, listening with the whole being. And this came about for me as an idea through long durational listening in uh, natural environments, where I found that over a period of listening, my body disappeared and I just became a kind of agency, a kind of sense in the space, in the sound field, listening. And this for me is really ecosystemic listening. And when we're doing this, we listen, or I listen without classification. We listen in fact with our entire being. We may listen relationally to work out context, but through listening, we merge into and become one with the ecosystem. We are listening to the entire gestalt of the here, and the now. Thich Nhat Hanh beautifully says, only when we recognize our connectedness to the earth can real change begin. And you can see that I'm suggesting here through ecosystemic listening that this is a really fantastic way of connecting to the earth. So 
the Acoustic Ecology Lab at ASU has uh, been engaged in community work now for many years, uh, teaching listening modes in the community, engaging them in field recording workshops, creative practice, and the ongoing Listen project. And when thinking about climate impact, um, I think that ecological listening and environmental listening can be a key tool for change. So Ezra Klein commented recently in his New York Times podcast that we are not going to legislate enough, quickly enough to stop climate change. That we cannot, that cannot be the only path. So then what options are left? What options do we have if politics fails? And as a society, we've really been too slow, too risk averse to move forward, too scared to upset others, to change the balance of power, the status quo, the very things that have led us to this place where we now face a climate catastrophe. So then what we're seeking to do through developing community environmental listening groups is to empower the community to facilitate environmental agency and stewardship through listening. We envisage a future where people embrace their presence on the land on which they live and thus understand and foster a more balanced ecosystem. And our mission then is to provide tools, training and resources to build community-based environmental listeners in support of a sustainable planet. Because change must be led by each of us we can't just look to the big institutions to manage this. So environmental listening assists us to be aware of the environments in which we live, to explore that environment through sound, to be more connected to that environment and to expand our sensibilities towards us. To be act more locally, to be more local, to be part of the ecosystem, to hear the species that are present, for instance, and to hear them when seasons change and the transformation of those sonic ecosystems. And to be, in fact, more grounded, more present. Environmental listening is also free. It can be practiced by anybody at any time. So what we're trying to do at this very time is to develop a guidebook for environmental listening groups and, and to, to develop a set of workshops where we're going to help train people in listening modes, principally active, passive and directed listening, so that they have a skill set that they can take away and practice in their communities, to help foster and support community groups through those resources, but also through podcasts and newsletters and an online web portal for the community. And these resources will be available later this year because we really believe that if we can change the way people listen, we can actually change the world. If you're interested in being involved with this, you're welcome to email me or to email my PhD student, Celia, who will keep track of everybody who might be interested in forming an environmental listening group. And um, that was a bit of a rush, but I know that we only have 10 minutes. Um, so there's some emails there, but thank you very much for listening. An admirable job. Thank you so much, Garth. And I'm very interested in talking more with you about the community environmental listening groups. That's that's a great project. Okay, um, thank you. So our second speaker is Jeremy Strawn. And Jeremy, I'm now going to spotlight you. Thanks, Ellen. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you just fine. Great. I just wanted to say thanks again for uh, <clears throat> not just asking me to uh, be here today, but also for the entire day uh, itself. It's been really fascinating. I have been on call for, for most of the day, um, unbelievably. <laughs> um, uh, um, and it's been uh, really provocative. Um, uh, there's a few sort of things I wanted to talk about. I didn't, I'm going to set my time before I forget. Um, that uh, I, I have a script that I've uh, kind of made, um, but also part of me just wants to kind of go off script and just respond to everything that's been going on today in the context of the reason why you <laughs> asked me to share some of uh, the work that I've been doing. But um, three things seem to, in my reading of today, um, I've been sort of trying to think about uh, Schaefer in uh, a, a broader context, um, where, as you mentioned earlier on in uh, your uh, con opening context remarks, it's sort of this, this 
the things that connect his 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 kind of big field the fields in which he's worked so uh, composition and um, pedagogy education also um, sound studies and so I've been thinking about this idea of relationality that seems to be animating a lot of our discussions so the intellectual relationality uh, professional creative even personal to Schaefer so many people here worked with Schaefer for years and years and how that impacts his legacy also relationality to place um, and how they kind of animate all those things sort of animate his practice but also the idea of complexity um, Schaefer's so, such a complex person um, and that has come up in the work that I've been doing with um, the Canadian Music Center and the Indigenous Advisory Council, as well as the other council you mentioned that I sit on, the Accountability for Change Council. And that complexity also, I think, is born out of a sense of discomfort um, <laughs> around Schaefer. And, you know, Schaefer's uh, writings, as, as several of us have, have talked about today, are uh, a few people, uh, Mitchell, I, I call them probes, and I think that's... Uh, accurate in a lot of ways, given his intellectual um, uh, connection to McLuhan and the thinking and writing of that time. Uh, I think it's really important, though, to uh, just spend a, a quick minute on that idea of a probe and what, you know, um, there was a comment about putting ideas out and, and letting them resonate and seeing what kind of reactions there are. And I think that's valuable, but I also think that it's really, really critical in the case of some of what Schaefer has written towards um, the supposed inherit inheritance of Indigenous culture uh, to non-Indigenous Canadians as part of that kind of national um, growth and maturation that he wrote about, that we can't, uh, we can't divorce the sense of responsibility that comes from writing and those positions of privilege and authority that Schaefer occupied, where he was able to, in fact, animate and shape those discourses on sound and on belonging and on citizenship. So, and the reason why I bring that up is because I, I there's been a few comments. I mean, I, 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 most people here are probably are familiar with Dylan's book. Um, and that quote that opens um, Dylan's book from Schaefer, which I won't repeat because it's a, com it's a complicated, a difficult quote, and especially on a day like today um, uh, in Canada, in that uh, though those kinds of words, they frame certain relationships with Schaefer as a, as a central historical and creative figure, especially from performance. So I need to, maybe I'll just, I'll park that there um, and move through my script. And I've set a timer for myself, so we absolutely don't go over. Um, but um, I am here from Ottawa, unceded Anishinaabe Algonquin territory, where I've been a guest for the past three years. I'm, I'm not indigenous, I'm not a white settler musicologist, but I've spent uh, quite a long time thinking about issues of appropriation in Canadian art music. Um, I had this screen share, I'm gonna do it. I think um, at this point in the day, uh, the, the simpler, the better um, in terms of technological slip up. So as long as everyone can hear me, that's good. And uh, as Ellen mentioned, I've been involved with this project, um, uh, which is being uh, led by Dylan Robinson is um, uh, in partnership with a number of institutional stakeholders, uh, including the Canadian Music Centre, the Canada Council for the Arts, the Department of Canadian Heritage and previously Queen's University. Um, that has been uh, tasked with uh, offering uh, recommendations on how to deal with the uh, kind of history of appropriation of Indigenous culture, uh, song, story, um, texts um, by composers uh, in Canada, and more specifically associate composers of the Canadian Music Centre. So um, how can we conceptualize Indigenous-led processes of redress of accountability and how can those be actioned at a kind of inter-institutional level and so the first stage of that project uh, happened um, fall through spring and it was uh, some something of an extension of the work that I was doing while I was at Queens as a banting as well too um, but this is a little bit more um, uh, less research output oriented and more kind of um, how can we offer a kind of, it's a kind of a pilot project uh, that the Canada Council and Heritage were very interested in funding and seeing what would happen if we actually got a group of Indigenous arts experts, curators, museologists, composers, performers, and um, uh, thought through different ways um, of, of beginning this process. And so 
I just want to say first and foremost that it's a long process. Um, that my role in it is as a kind of um, sort of a link between, for example, the CMC where I've worked and done advisory work for many, many years, but also as a musicologist who has the knowledge of um, this particular history of uh, music in Canada, um, but also as somebody who can kind of um, perhaps speak a little with a little bit more um, uh, kind of background experience to why these issues are perhaps sort of important. And so it's been a really interesting process so far. And right now, the second phase of this project is in uh, just in contracting with Heritage Canada to um, produce a documentary film. So we're excited to see that um, move forward. Um, now, with the context of Schaefer, I think I don't it, I don't really need to sort of go over some of the things that have been talked about. And I had a whole bunch of quotes that I was going to read, but um, I think it's fair to assume that at this point in our uh, thinking about Schaefer and these issues of appropriation is that there's a lot of problematic music that came out in addition to some of the writing. Um, there's a lot of approach of not just songs, but also um, uh, important uh, images, um, uh, symbols, the medicine wheel, um, clan structure, kinship structures, um, ap appropriations of approaches to ceremony, um, of regalia in some of the pieces that Schaefer has uh, composed. Um, but also, and I I'm kind of summarizing, uh, or at least sort of recapitulating some of these ideas that I've heard over the months and years, but even a relationality to land, right? This idea of of re-ritualizing our relation to land um, as being a kind of complex sort of provocation of its own that requires some, some care and thinking about. Um, so in one of our meetings of the IAC, the Indigenous Advisory Council, we uh, kind of took on Schaefer. Um, several members of the IAC had been asking me sort of in previous meetings, in Zoom, like, when are we gonna talk to Schaefer? We don't talk about Schaefer. And so <clears throat> what I wanted to do today was to sort of convey some of those sentiments in fairly broad terms, um, being extremely mindful of the challenges of <laughs> being a non-Indigenous uh, interlocutor. Um, there's my two-minute timer. Uh, about uh, speaking on behalf or for. And I think obviously that's problematic. And on a day like today, that's uh, deeply problematic. So I just want to share uh, in, in very broad general terms some of the kinds of responses that came up in relation to um, this work. Um, one is that it's complicated. Maybe I've said that already. Schaefer is just endlessly complicated. Um, it's, there's no simple answer. He needs to be kind of encountered and um, I don't want to say dealt with, that sounds awful, but he needs to be sort of thought through in ways that other composers who may have misused a particular song or a particular story, um, it's just different, right? Schaefer borrowed uh, honestly from all um, around the world. Um, but also there's this deep kind of professional intellectual affinity that, um, and as Dylan has mentioned too earlier on today, Dylan's a, in some ways a product of Schaefer's, Schaefer's uh, you know, sort of really, really uh, revolutionary interdisciplinarity in Canada at a time when thinking like that was not um, uh, the, the, the norm. I remember there's that famous <laughs> line from Schaefer when he came back from abroad to find the same uh, what did he call it? The same porcine entrepreneurs promoting the same honey balls or something like that. You know, just the same, the same thing over and over again. Um, um, Schaefer is a kind of elephant in the room for a lot of us, I think. Um, the idea that uh, there's this kind of uh, dynamic of, again, personal, professional, um, and kind of creative uh, alliances and affinities and groups in Canada where um, colleagues have, you know, per performed work that is problematic for some people, right? But I mean, it's, you know, one thing I've often thought about is Canada's a huge place geographically, the territories, the geographies of what we call Canada are huge, but it's a, it's a small place uh, in a lot of ways, right? Canadian music's a small scene. Canadian art music is an incredibly smaller scene. Uh, everyone kind of works with other uh, with each other, and so these kind of these kinds of lineages and um, these intersections and interactions of personal histories, professional histories, when they kind of butt up against issues of ethics appropriation, and we, I mean, and racism, like just straight up racism, I think is not unfair to sort of say, 
um, make for very, very complicated um, kinds of conversations and discussions. And so I think I'll just kind of wrap there. I know we're getting at time, but one of the, the, on the last sort of thing, I think I feel fairly comfortable sort of sharing is that one in this meeting was um, Schaefer's writing and compositions were happening at a time when there weren't opportunities for groups of uh, indigenous leaders in performance and composition to come together in a space and kind of like say like, you know, and, and talk through these issues. And the big question that I would leave is like, well, what would Schaefer's legacy look like? Uh, how would we be dealing with it if that in fact were the case um, at the time when he was writing uh, some of the things he was writing? So I'll, yeah, I'll stop there so we can just uh, keep moving forward, but thanks so much again. Yeah, thank you, Jeremy. That's, that's a really wonderful question to consider. Oh. Um, and our final talk today is David Jackson. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm, I'm also going to just reject the sharing of the screen for this, for this <laughs> end part. Um, and thank you to all the presenters who've preceded me today uh, for all their insights and contributions. Uh, it's really been a fantastic day. I've been sitting here since 830 with my, with my headphones on, uh, just listening to all these inspiring and important projects, uh, giving me a lot to think about. Um, so, and to all the organizers for an, an absolutely excellent event. Uh, and I am a white settler coming to you from the unceded and unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin Nation. And as Ellen alluded to as the last, the last panel and the last presenter, uh, it does feel like maybe like I'm the all ages closing set where everyone has to leave and, and, and uh, catch the last bus, but that's fine. Uh, and I am probably going to end on a heavy minor key. Uh, I'll send out sort of like a, a doom metal soundscape probe that maybe doesn't make any sense, but I'll send it out into the world anyways. Because when I saw this, uh, this panel prompt, which had to do with sort of sound emergency and ethics, uh, I couldn't help but feel that there was kind of this really interest, interesting interrelated triad um, into which each concept sort of flowed uh, to think about our contemporary world and our contemporary soundscape. So I'm going to try to think of them together. And many of the talks today have uh, pointed towards some of the serious emergencies of violence and sonic absence and partial uh, archiving, disappearance, gentrification, and, and environmental witnessing uh, through sonic ethnography and how we deal with people, places, sounds, and narratives. So the question I sort of, uh, you know, was, was thinking about was uh, what direction to take soundscape, soundscape studies in as we think of contemporary emergency and the ethics that comes with uh, working within an artistic milieu. Uh, and I want to make three kind of moves here that are slightly related to my own work, which I'm not really going to get into very much, but I sort of want to indicate some of the, the urgency around the current emergencies that are affecting our species globally today. Secondly, I want to use this notion that Schaefer has around sound design and the soundscape as an art form uh, as a possible sensor in the sense of uh, an alarm uh, uh, that indicates the emergency that we're currently living through. And finally, I wanna to turn to sort of the, uh, the ethics of aestheticizing emergency by deploying uh, Felix Guattari's concept of the etho aesthetic, ethico aesthetic. So maybe this is kind of a dystopian soundscape studies that's more interested in the end of things um, so the focus of much of my, my research uh, sort of asks the question, what is ecological and acoustic ecology and examined sites such as cities, rivers, glaciers, public parks, uh, and also examines ideas around sound and multiplicity and multiple subjectivities. And I've sort of come through my research to see ecology both in the environmental sense of the, word, the way we understand organisms existing in an environment, but also as a totality encompassing the social, cultural, and political effects that capitalism has on all aspects of life, which has kind of instigated an urgent crisis 
in the decline of our collective shared environments. Uh, thinking sound, emergency, and ethics together puts us, I think, in direct confrontation with the past few years of increased cycles of financial panic, the pandemic, uh, living through the sixth great extinction of species, the rise of the alt-right, the general slide towards the less democratic world, the alienation of citizenship from governance, the deepening effects of inertia around climate action, continued white supremacy and racism, the war in the Ukraine, uh, fake news, Iran, I could go on and on and on. But the emergency here, I think, is urgently interconnected, which is kind of my gambit, that this is an ecology of facts in a declining late liberalism or late capitalism that sound can contribute to investigating. Rather than these being discrete processes, they are instead the inevitable interconnected outcomes of what Schaefer and many, many others identified as harbingers of environmental decline and the perceptual changes brought about by electrification, industrialism, and urbanism. So to turn a little bit deeper to the emergency, I want to use Roy Scranton uh, in his ideas in his short but powerful book from 2013, Learning to Die in the Anthropocene, Reflections on the End of a Civilization, which considerably, considerably opens us towards thoughts of the outcomes of these emergencies through his argument that our contemporary world is coming to an end. Scranton, an American war veteran of the 2003 to 2011 war in Iraq, witnessed the destruction of a civilization through military doctrines of shock and awe, rampant profiteering, and total deliberate environmental destruction. After returning to the US, he was deployed to New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina, his division recruited for riot control these two experiences are knit in his mind as the same failure of planning and compassion, which moved him towards an environmentalism rooted in the knowledge of what he had witnessed of the breakdown of the machinery of contemporary civilization. In his book, Scranton argues that this is it. The chance to change course has passed. The military is already strategically prepared for all of the outcomes to deal with the end of things. Civilization is dying, a new world is being created. I told you it was a downer, right? Uh, the new world is being created and we need to quote, let go of our old way of life, let our old way of life die while protecting, sustaining, and re reworking our collective stores of cultural technologies. Scranton writes, <laughs> we're fucked. The only questions are how soon and how badly. So what is needed, Scranton argues, is new ways of thinking, new ways of acting will be necessary to rescue and regenerate our species through the transition of one world to another. He writes that change, quote, demands we transcend the visually representative picture thinking and work instead to create a sense of collective humanity that exists beyond any place, life, or time. But interestingly, he doesn't really turn towards sound as a way towards this, but towards uh, a kind of a deep alliance of human and non-human actors, uh, a kind of a relational ontology, who live with and without us and are recognized as having their own, uh, their own being. Basically a symbiosis that breaks the hierarchies of lived realities, knowledges, and ways of being in relation to and being with, as well as becoming. These relations include geographies, geologies, and non-humans, but also media, sound, vision, and thinking. Another thinkers along this line would include uh, Donna Haraway, of course, the idea of making kin, uh, Elizabeth Povanelli's Economies of Abandonment and Geoontologies, Emma Toffigosh's Reckoning with the Great Derangement of, of uh, Climate Change, Rob Nixon's Slow Violence, Tim Morton's Dark Ecologies, and Eduardo Viveros de Castro's Relative Natives, and many of the people whose work we have heard today. So I think we can take a little bit here that Schaefer's identification of the soundscape brings him a little bit into the orbit of these thinkers by positing the recognition and understanding of the soundscape as a modulation between the, the attention to the non-human and human worlds, and who recognized, perhaps badly and problematically for sure at times, but who understood that the soundscape was a vital indicator of both the health of a sound environment, 
but also about the world more generally, which we can, I think, usefully extend for our contemporary thinking. So this is the hopeful paragraph, but uh, as a species, we continue to create, to hope, to exist, to build, to think, to grow, to learn, and to try to counter the dissonance of the world by making de deeper connections with, this, with the stuff of the world. And Mickey Valley um, invoked Michelle Serres, whose work is, is really central to mine. So I went and I pulled out this little piece um, because noise is, in Serres' ontology, the background of all human being out of which arises and you, the unities and assemblages that give our world form, if only temporarily. Uh, drawing on a definition of noise, so this is like sort of contra shaver that traverses both the metaphysical and informational, Serres conceives noise as, a funda as fundamental to the birth of time and space. Serres challenges the viewpoint that reduces the world to singularities and wholes in attempt to theorize complexity through a thinking of the way that the sea, forests, rumor, society, life, and labor are a part of the flow of all things. Serres writes that background no noise is the ground of our perception. Absolutely uninterrupted, it is our perennial sustenance, the element of the software of all our logic. So the question then becomes uh, how we can put the soundscape uh, can put soundscape studies in conversation with ideas like Scranton's, idea like ideas of Serres, and whether we might understand acoustic ecology as a cultural technology deployed by maybe an acoustic designer or an artist uh, you know, as a way to think things new. So how does acoustic ecology then contribute to listening to and for change? How do we come to see the soundscape as a composition and the acoustic of how the designer uses science and art to shape, preserve, and amplify sounds within it. How do we make design inclusive? What does the designer build? What does this, what does this, uh, what does this acoustic designer soundscape look like? Um, how does the designer act as a sensor? What traces are left in the soundscape that witness our current collapse? How is the soundscape an infrastructural media and what information can be drawn from it? For Schaefer, it seems that the answer is often sort of found in amplifying the beautiful hi-fi natural sounds, which we've talked quite a lot about today. And I wonder here within this, this sort of this gambit that I'm making, if in the moment of an emergency, such as I've traced it, that silencing the noise of the alarm bells because they make us uncomfortable uh, is both irresponsible and unethical. Um, so I'd like to think a little bit about listening as a creative act and the art of acoustic design more broadly as an art. Uh, I'm interested here in the politics of the soundscape defined broadly by the way that sound structures us as subjects, sensibly, technologically, perceptually, and effectively. Listening to or designing a soundscape brings together the sensible and the self in what Felix Guattari has termed the ethico-aesthetic paradigm that connects creative processes with ethical accountability. Quote, to speak of creation is to speak of the responsibility of the creative instance with regard to the thing being created. And I think this sort of explains, you know, when we were talking earlier about the discomfort of hitting play or asking if you can record, this is the ethics that can be in, enacted in, in sort of these practices that we, we use as an art. Um, so this is an entanglement of subjectivities and environments with other things. Listening is an ethical problem as it situates itself with attention to the threshold between becomings with and towards an, an awareness of the world's, uh, world's multiplicities. Becoming with also puts us up in a position of belonging to, involving us in practices of living that require certain amounts of empathy, understanding, and creativ creativity no matter how imperfectly practiced. Art is a way of exploring these relationships and giving new form to living, even if that is agonistically. Christoph Brunner argues that artistic research should be approached affectively through an understanding of how art connects um, thinking and feeling. Art and creativity are, quote, modes of attentiveness and awareness of how an event is composed in its singularity and how it leaves its traces, which actually I think echoes nicely with uh, sort of the, the notion of the ear witness uh, that pushes us towards this uh, ethics within the 
create the, within creation. The mobilization of effective forces is an attunement to the processes of the event of becoming something else. How do we hear this transition? How do we hear the silencing of our environment? What happens when we can no longer hear the world? What happens when we can't hear the great extinction currently underway? How do we feel in these, in these spaces, the disappearance of amphibian worlds, for example, but rather than a singularity as Brunner would have it, I think that I would like to prefer to open this up towards a multiplicity of listenings, to listen to sound as a process that produces a knowledge and understanding of how that experience is situated within the various other events that it is a part of. Not soundscape then, but soundscapes, not sound, but sounds. As an aesthetic object, the soundscape pushes, uh, pushes us to include things beyond the human. Thinking situates us in relation to a world where we have to ask what is happening beyond the human always. As a mode of inquiry, art moves us towards an understanding of what is happening that creatively takes us beyond method and techniques of cognition towards, quote, and this is Brunner, the ethico aesthetic and ethical aesthetic research, acoustic design, ethical and political implications come through the responsibility that comes with creating something or even in listening. Art is ethical because it asks questions and orients critical and reflective understandings of ways of doing and making worlds. Whether we are the artist or the observer, art makes a connection with the world being made and unmade as we apprehend it. The ethics of art recognizes that it, much like reality, is a contrivance and an artifice, but one that has a deep resonance with us and serious implications for living. Similarly, soundscapes do not just disclose worlds, but are part of the construction of our various realities. As the art world is turned towards ethical forms of making and explicitly embraced social engagement as a process, the knowledge it generates has become a part of the living performance and by corollary, the sonic environment we live in. And I am way over time, so I'll just leave it there, but uh, thank you all. And I really appreciate the opportunity to come and talk to you today. Thank you so much, David. I think that that's a, a very um, a very strong kind of, of ending. So I really appreciate that. I, I'm going to just pin all three of you, which means I think I have to un, unspotlight you for a second. So Garth and Jeremy, uh, spotlight and Garth. Getting good at this. Okay, it's all good. All right. Um, I, I you were pinging so many things for me. Um, I feel like uh, I feel like I love this term somophony. You know, this idea of embodiment of sound, embodied listening, and listening as resonating beyond hearing and beyond the the the, the sense of of hearing. Uh, I love this idea of this subtle body listening, and and this frame of dependent arising that came out of your talk, Garth, I think there's a, a there's a resonance for me here, and maybe you'll you'll agree or disagree between that frame of dependent arising and this, this idea of becoming with, um, you know, the, the that, uh, that David brought up, and the relationality that that Jeremy brought up in, in uh, you know, your, your, your generous kind of um, consideration of this very difficult task you've been part of, which is, I think, a sitting and listening in discomfort, you know, a, a necessary um, reckoning with with the consequences of uh, Schaefer's thought. Um, I'd like to, uh, you know, open up for questions from the audience if you have energy to <laughs> to ask any at this late stage. But while we're waiting for that, um, maybe we can just uh, have a, a, a little bit of a, an exchange among the three of you about, you know, am I right? Are there connections between these three talks? And, and ultimately, what do you think about this question? Are, are you optimistic about the possibility of the, some of the ideas that Schaefer, among with others, engaged in, in addressing huge ethical and, and physical issues of our times. 
Garth, you seem to be optimistic about it. You, you, you had a sense of you're doing something at your institute. Yeah. Um, thank you, Ellen. Um, uh, I guess, am I optimistic? I'm not sure that I'm optimistic. Um, certainly there's a lot of literature around that says we're past the point of return. Um, however, I think that what's perhaps most important is that individuals in society feel that they have some tools to address changes and that they have uh, empowered to feel stewardship and agency. I think often, and, and I guess, you know, if we had more time, we could unpick who am I talking about, because obviously I'm talking more about urban communities than I am perhaps about people who are living on the land. Um, and, you know, particularly in a place like um, Phoenix, where everybody drives in an air conditioned car to an air conditioned building and we don't go outside for months on end because <laughs> we're just going to die. Um, so 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 I think there's I think it's more about um, redirecting our attentions from thinking that we are waiting for the government to come up with solutions. Um, that policy is somehow going to drive change that's going to, to, to turn these things around and redirecting that attention to a kind of um, open, um, open arm kind of welcome to people to engage in the, with the land on which they live more directly and hopefully through that to change patterns of behaviour. Um, I can say that in, in generally when we teach just active directed and passive listening in like a half day workshop, the response that I get from people is often um, overwhelming. I mean, people are like, oh my God, you just changed the entire world for me. And, and it's kind of like, well, not really, you already had those skills and you were already doing that, but now you have some terminology to define a skill set that you can take away and use. So. I, I guess I think those are, are really important and perhaps they just play a small part in how we go forward. Yeah, thank you. Um, Jeremy, you were talking about, of course, a, a different kind of crisis, but it's no less um, acute. This, this in Canada uh, and in many places in, in the world, this idea of how do we reckon with our history, with genocide, with trauma, and, and what would it mean for I mean, I, I would actually love to see this and in a group of indigenous musicians having, you know, this conversation about Schaefer in a way that that um, would create an intervention into in, into the ideas, not just into the music. Sure. I mean, I know we're at the end of a very long day and I just want to signal as well to Ellen how well uh, everything is run and you uh, just the, the the stewardship of this day long zoom meeting I can only imagine has been uh, extremely taxing so just bravo and thanks so much for making it such a great experience. Um, yeah okay so just real quick, um, a couple of things. Um, so one thing that I think is valuable in, in a way that I think also kind of relates to our three kinds of conversations or our, our three presentations in this panel together is that even though, as I said, I think Schaefer is an incredibly complex person um, who has, who inspires a range of really um, strong responses and reactions from across the board. So you mentioned a group of uh, indigenous musicians reacting to Schaefer. Well, that's kind of what we sort of did. And I don't feel that it was, I don't feel it's ethical or appropriate for me to kind of, you know, ventriloquate that some of those responses other than just say that they were they were strong and they were um like really strong really strong responses to in in ways that i think that we we haven't really had today at all and in, in which schaefer doesn't really receive sort of in a broader public um field but to that end i think one of the more valuable things about thinking through these issues through schaefer is that schaefer uh highlighted a kind of ethics and a responsibility to land or to place that although it, we've you know i think is problematic for uh in a number of ways but i think that's if if we can think about that as a kind of like um you know one of the broader sort of values about shapers thinking in the 21st century context is that yeah like you said you mentioned the word reckoning i'm thinking about sort of another r word that we need to think about which is not the obvious one but things like reciprocity right like how can we as 
listeners and you know in my context um people working within institutions who are grappling with these kinds of like systemic sort of legacies of exclusion and dispossession and, and harm um how can how can those how can there be a kind of like ethical framework a responsible framework to kind of move ahead and so i think there is a lot in schaefer's legacy that like allows us to kind of fundamentally center those 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 perspectives and and maybe really what i i i feel like i'm being very clumsy this late in the day but you know i'm i'm not suggesting that what we want is uh, for me, this isn't this isn't weirdly all about Schaefer. Like I, I'm not sure that the most productive thing is for anybody to be, you know, to sort of be um, assessing and then okay, now we're done. It's really about um, what are what some so many of the exciting, innovative, uh, you know, extensions of these ideas and and other origin points and uh, you know broader perspectives that we've heard today. That's what is energizing me and making me think that this this broader context of music sound listening environment is is such a rich and and uh, you know so full of potential right for for improving life and david you seemed more optimistic at the end of your talk than i <laughs> going to be <laughs> because you seem to think that art has efficacy so i wondered if you had uh, could just talk about that just a little bit yeah, I, I mean, I'm not sure where that that impulse came from. I think I just, you know, I felt I felt I needed to to not be so, such a gloomy Gus. But um, and I think, you know, like I am hopeful, but it's sort of like a hope that's predicated on an, on a preparation of grappling with the reality of what what is going to happen. So it was, small dog who needs to pee who's like flapping at me and licking licking me furiously so if i'm distracted and keep looking down that's what i'm doing um you know and i i think it is it i mean i don't know i've been sort of reading a lot of fiction lately about you know the the hope that comes afterwards um you know what what happens when after like what happened what what are we going to do what are we going to do when all institutions are failed when there is no government when there is no military when there is no police when there is no one to take care of you what do you do what kind of system do you implement and a lot of there's this phenomenal book called everything for everyone an oral history of the new york commune 2052 to 2072 which takes the like all these notions like the world collapses because um the police stop protecting the rich and the rich all go to outer space and people decide that they'll just leave them up there and they'll just cut them off right and they'll they can figure it out for themselves um it's a really it's kind of like a really hard thought to think that you're just going to let a bunch of people just die in space because they've ruined the world um and interestingly sound and the trauma of all this is taken care of in these in this new sort of utopian configuration so they've thought through you know like well what happens to people who have to make decisions like that well they need um, mass amounts of therapy what happens to children whose families have been killed in some kind of civil war that breaks out in Florida when Florida disappears underwater, uh, as it is today. Um, you know, uh, those kids need to be taken care of and they, you need to think about uh, what's to come. And it's a really, it's a really, it's hard thinking, right? It is this sort of this very, very, I think, difficult thought to have, but it's also a possible potential that we need to, to keep in mind uh things are not going to always be this way i don't think so then like that's why I, my, my hope comes in and that is like you know that we actually uh you know we will take care of each other that we will figure it out that we will find new ways um just one of the things i see in the chat is how will we document and archive this brief moment of peak technology uh one of the other novels i've been reading has really been it really thinks that through like in Brixton what happens to music culture uh, after electricity goes away mm -hmm. well they can only use, find uh, battery powered tape machines and they or can only find uh, music up to about 1999 and it's all jungle and drum and bass mixtapes because that's what survived right <laughs> and that's the technology that like was able to survive um, 
and it can be battery powered, but everything that was like in the cloud is gone. So, you know, I just think these are, are interesting, interesting thoughts, but also uh, confrontations with reality that I think we're going to be, be dealing with. Yeah, de de definitely uh, ending on a, on a futuristic n note and, and yet an imminent <laughs> kind of present. Um, thank you all very much indeed. Uh, I, I'm going to just turn to a, a few thank yous uh, before we go. And uh, with my the powers invested in me by Zoom, I have made it possible for uh, everybody at, at this end to turn on their cameras and unmute should they wish to. And gosh, uh, if you would like to turn on your camera, I'd sure like to see you and just thank you all very much indeed for being with us today. A really wonderful day. Um, there are some people I need to thank. Uh, first of all, my colleagues Paul Teberge and Valentina Bertolani, uh, both of whom were very helpful in organizing this symposium, thinking it through. Uh, Valentina worked with uh, one of our great graduate students, Sergio Parra, to create the resource that's on the website. If you have additions to that resource, please, please send them my way. Um, I want to thank Kessler Douglas up here in the corner here, who has been our tech all day long today and who also supported the concert last week. Thank you so much, Kessler, for giving, as a busy graduate student, giving so many hours um, and, and doing such a great job. And uh, Rebecca Cowell, who's not here, who also helped with social media and uh, is slowly dragging me into the 21st century that way. The staff in the Faculty of uh, Arts and Social Sciences are fantastic, um, and Paul Jason in uh, the School for Studies in Art and Culture did design the posters. We've been talking a lot about, you know, relationality today, and nothing happens without the help of a ton of people who roll up their sleeves and do every little tiny thing. So when I emailed Alyssa Tremblay uh, 17,000 times about the website <laughs> to make changes, um, that, that's, a, that's a huge support. And finally, just thank you to all of you for your work today, for the presenters, and for uh, those of you who put in the hours to stay on Zoom, such an absurd amount of time. Um, this, uh, the follow up for this project will be, uh, we hope, a, a book looking at uh, the extended, not the legacy of Murray Schaefer, but extensions of music, sound, environment, um, uh, listening into the future. Uh, through that consideration. Um, so say, stay tuned. Thank you all so, so much. <laughs>